critical, in fact, deeply resentful of the Communist Party because they were persecuted by the Communist Party. But there is also a political Chinese identity among the Weisenren. So they see themselves as destined to reunite the mainland under the flag of the Republic of China. They had the memory of being as the subject of the Japanese imperial empire. So yeah. they remember history differently, and therefore they didn't really resonate with that sense of grievances. You're in for such a treat today. In today's video, you're Asian Naval Insight from Taiwan, and I will be talking about all the awkward questions around China's cross-strait relations. We talked about Taiwan's political identity, its internal division, the influence of Japanese imperialism, and so much more. If you want to understand what makes Taiwan different from the mainland, and why this difference is so difficult to bridge, you do not want to miss out on this episode. Let's welcome your Asia Naval Insight. It might come as a little bit of surprise, but I will actually consider myself as someone that is quite heavily influenced by the Taiwanese culture, especially when I was a teenager. At the time in the mainland, the entertainment industry wasn't very developed. So we do import a lot of entertainment and cultural products from Taiwan. Being a teenager, I had the biggest crush on Jay Chou. Okay, yeah, um, my cousin likes him as well. Um, she had the biggest crush on him uh, for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I find that culture very resonating. Even when I moved to the UK, I also went out with a Taiwanese person and, you know, that further added up my sort of relationship, mm -hmm. like little relationship with Taiwan. When I went to the UK and things started to become a little bit different, people would start to tell you different things, especially being a political science student. And they would ask me opinions on, oh, what do you think of Taiwan? And why do you think Taiwan should be a part of China? And they would come to debate me about it. Right. And that was yep. when the time it all became very, very confusing. It also gave me chills to admit this. I. Mm actually went through a period of time when I actually would be very rebellious. I would tell my parents, oh, if Taiwan is a part of China, then why it has such a, a different passport? Why do we have to apply for a visa when we visit Taiwan? Why does it have a different government? And of course, I would get a lot of uh, pushback from them. Yeah. And then I also went through a period of time when I also would want to believe that stand with the Beijing's point of view. But I also was super afraid of what my friends would think. I would be afraid that if they would judge me and that if I would lose them. So that was what I went through. And I think now at this point, I feel like I've gotten more confident. I'm a lot more detached from this entire debate that I'm mm. at a place that I could be confident enough to say, you know what, I actually identify with Beijing because that's just who I am. That's just the kind of culture that I came from. It's not necessarily about what is right or wrong. It is just what my experience was. Um, yeah. But I also feel like intellectually speaking, I still find that the case for Taiwan equally re understanding, if not mm -hmm. more convincing. What makes you say it's more convincing? Just, just I, guess, was, yeah. I guess intellectually speaking, it's more like there, there are many arguments that mm -hmm. were made for Taiwan, right? Um, one yeah. being that, well, just because you said Taiwan wasn't a country doesn't mean that it is not a country. Like they're just yeah. sort of using this compartmentalized thinking. It has an independent government and passport and entire media system, jurisdiction. Mm. So it just means that it, it is functioning as an independent country. So right. um, the fact that you didn't acknowledge that doesn't mean that, uh, de facto speaking, it is not. It's sort of like, okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But still, mm. I don't want to agree with you. <laughs> Yeah, you know, what you're really saying is it shouldn't be an independent country. A country requires recognition to a certain extent. You're not saying that Taiwan can't function as a country. You're, you're basically agreeing that it can, but it's about whether it should. That is exactly where this debate can't end, right? Because if you just sort of compartmentalize what Taiwan means, then you will just talk about Taiwan out of the entire international context. The, the tension I mentioned is the, the nuance that I think would be interesting to dive into. Question over to you. Would you consider yourself as a Chinese or Taiwanese? And again, how yeah. important do you think this difference is? I consider myself both Chinese and Taiwanese. I, I will say though in English, um, the word Chinese is not very nuanced. It's kind of like a sweeping label because you know overseas Chinese, for example, in the United States or, or Singaporeans, for example, uh, Malaysians, they would call themselves Chinese, 
but not in a political sense. So, so they're not a citizen of the People's Republic of China. Okay, w what they're saying is they're ethnic Chinese, they're cultural Chinese, and in Chinese we do have different terms between political Chinese, so people who are part of China, who are member of the Chinese state. The term for this is Zhongguo Ren, and the cultural Chinese is Hua Ren, which is loosely translated as、um, a member of the grand culture. So in Taiwan, the answer you get will depend on which label you're asking about. If you ask people whether they are Zhongguo Ren, many will say no. In fact, I think most would say no, especially most of the young people. Some might say yes, and it's not an insignificant minority either. You'll get quite a few people who would say yes. But that's a much more controversial question than if you ask, "Are you a Huaren? Are you an ethnic Chinese?" The vast majority of people will say yes. There might be some exceptions, but those people are seen as on the more extreme end of the pro-independence nativist point of view. So I do consider myself Chinese in both the cultural and political sense, but I also consider myself Taiwanese. I think everyone in Taiwan, the vast majority, would consider ourselves Taiwanese. Because we're exposed to the food, the entertainment culture, as you just talked about, the exposure to the political system, the highly partisan political system, which is kind of intrinsic to the Taiwanese democratic culture. So, how do you reconcile the difference between identifying as politically Chinese and politically Taiwanese? I do technically see Ch Taiwan as a part of China, maybe not a part of the People's Republic of China, but as part of the civilizational state that is China. Who was your biggest influence when it comes to your political identity? May I ask? I've got to think about that for a few seconds. There, there's a range of different influences. So there's my education. So when I was growing up, I undertook my education at a time before the Democratic Progressive Party came to power and started changing everything.、Mm -hmm. So my education is full of, I, I suppose, traditional Chinese subjects. The classes that, that I take would make reference to Chinese myths,、um, stories, and histories. I remember receiving this massive encyclopedia when I was growing up. It's an encyclopedia of the world. It contained maps of different continents. When it showed the map of Asia, it would show that the Republic of China, that is controlling Taiwan, actually claims the entirety of mainland China. The People's Republic is not even on there. Okay, so we control the entirety of China. Including Mongolia, by the way, which the PRC does not claim, and our capital is at Nanjing rather than Beijing, because that was the capital of Chiang Kai-shek before he and his forces retreated、um, to Taiwan because they lost the war, the civil war. That is. Okay, that's actually interesting. The way you、uh, define how you view your Chinese identity, I think that is slightly different from the way I see my、okay. Chinese identity, politically speaking. I'm just speaking from. What Beijing would argue, right? I'm I'm not entirely speaking for myself, but like the entire okay, okay. like Chinese mainstream. So we would still、yeah. say that okay. So this is still not enough. This is still creating a different sense of nation state through exclusion, because that is through exclusion of discussing the CPC or slash CCP in our education, for example. So this is the time I'm gonna actually bring up my my middle school history education and al also my Chinese school. History education. So in my middle school, we talk about Chinese history, and I think there is a big part that is is similar to what you were taught. But then we actually had a lot of emphasis on modern Chinese history. We learned this in the middle school, and we also learned the same thing, the exact same thing in high school. So like the school really wanted us to learn this, like to really learn what being Chinese mean. Being Chinese means that what CCP. The people that it is leading went through during the entire century of humiliation, and as well as the civil war and the things that it was trying to build after 1949, very much centered on Marxism, the history of CPC. So that was the kind of history that we were taught.、Uh, I just remember that this was like such an important part of our history curriculum. This is still political, right? So the fact that what you learned in Taiwan didn't mention CPC or how. The KMT lost the war for us. It's like, oh, okay, so that is still, oh,、yeah. that's not right. That's not not the not the whole thing. That's not the the,、yeah. the main thing. <laughs> um, so there are similarities between what I went through as I progressed through the Taiwanese or the Republic of China education system in the nineteen nineties 
and what you just described. There's actually overlaps with parts of what you just talked about, but there's also differences. My family are what the Taiwanese refer to as Wai Senren, which literally means people from outside of the province. So Wai Senren are descendants of the either Chiang Kai-shek's army after they retreated to Taiwan, after they lost to the Communist Party, or the refugees that followed that army. In fact, mostly the refugees, I believe. And they're usually like landlords or the wealthier class. They would be persecuted by the CCP if they get caught by the Red Army. So they follow Chiang Kai-shek back to Taiwan. Wai Senren are deeply critical, in fact, deeply resentful of the Communist Party because they were persecuted by the Communist Party. But there is also a political Chinese identity among the Wai Senren. So they see themselves as destined to reunite the mainland under the flag of the Republic of China. Although in, in more recent decades, they realize that this is probably impossible militarily, and that unification can only occur on the terms of the Communist Party. Okay, Ben Senren are people who did immigrate to Taiwan from mainland China, but they did so hundreds of years ago during the, the Qin Dynasty or during the Min Dynasty. So they immigrated from Fujian province, carrying with them their the local dialect rather than the standard Mandarin that we speak now. My wife is actually Ben Senren, so they speak the Mingnan dialect, which is a local dialect in Taiwan and also the Fujian province. They also speak Tai Yu, which is a widely spoken dialect in Taiwan that mainlanders just cannot understand. And I can't even speak or understand most of it myself. My family supported pro-mainland candidates during elections. There's this man, a political personality um, named Li Ao, back in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. More like throughout the 1990s and the 2000s, Li Ao is a prominent historian and political commentator. Li Ao supported unification, immediate unification with the mainland by surrendering to the Communist Party. And many of my family members, from my uncle to my auntie, they listened to Li Ao religiously. And my auntie even voted for Li Ao in the year 2000 presidential elections when uh, Li Ao stood for office. He had no chance of winning, by the way, so that was a wasted vote. But shows where their sort of political views lie. Yeah, I just have a immediate comment when you、mm. mention Li Ao. Yeah, like it's just funny that you mention Li Ao because you know in Chinese in the Chinese mainstream environment ecosystem, obviously we do not allow any dissenting opinions on Taiwan. It is sort of just like our political boundary. Like this is a firm boundary, like no one can cross. If you cross, you'll be in trouble. If you look on content on on Chinese. Video platform, which is called Billy Billy, on Billy Billy, you will see people quoting voices from Taiwan to justify to even further enhance our position. The only Taiwanese speakers that you will be seeing on this on this platform is Li Ao. <laughs> Li Ao、yeah. is the he is the person that my dad, like he, my dad would constantly quotes to me. Like he will be obviously my entire family is very much. You know, with Beijing. So, and whenever we are talking about this topic, my dad would quote Li Ao. He would be like, "Oh, you know, there is a Taiwanese thinker and teacher in Taiwan called Li Ao, and he actually made this X Y Z comment." I think that、uh, Li Ao once said something、uh, in a debate with the DP- DPP leaning students, and the student was asking Li Ao, "So, why don't we? Why shouldn't we allow a referendum in Taiwan to vote it, to decide if Taiwan could be independent?" And Liao was like, "Oh, no! You know, if there is a referendum in Taiwan, then maybe we could have a referendum in China, so to decide if Taiwan could be independent, <laughs> <laughs> right?" So, <laughs> and that was the comments that was like constantly being quoted in the Chinese media. Like, look, this is what Taiwanese think leaders、mm. were th- saying. But when I actually look at what Liao represents in Taiwan, he was、uh, um, the member of the New Party, right? Yes, that's right. The new party. So that was like a very infamous, unpopular party in Taiwan.、Right? It it was yes.、Um, it had very little of the votes, like two or three percent at its peak.、Um, yeah, the the things that、um, the new、yeah. party was proposing、so、was pretty radical: immediate surrender,、yeah. um, don't care about you know changing to a one-party political system.、Um, that's something、yeah. that people just don't really accept, even if they are pro-unification.、Um, In some way, yeah, that's something that people are just not prepared for. So, 
Now, Benson Ren are more likely to support the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, who are reputed to be pro-independence. Now, I said reputed to be because they have never said, at least on an official basis, that they are pro-independence. They never said that they are working towards independence. Because if they said that, well, they'll never be elected. Because people know if they if they elect them, then there'll be a war, and nobody wants that. Okay, so yeah. they they signal their pro-independence leanings. Via certain signals, euphemisms, subtle wording, by what they do rather than by what they actually say. So,、yeah. um, they, just like that you ask. About... Yeah, that that that's right. Yeah, so dog whistling, you could say. Yeah. Now you see in Western media who presents the DPP as a pro-independence party and presents the Taiwanese political inclination as pro-independence. That is objectively wrong because. Independence is not something the the vast majority of the people support, and even those who support independence, they don't want independence immediately because that will bring a war. And people are not stupid, you know. They know that that's a war that will be devastating for Taiwan. They wouldn't vote for any DPP politicians that support independence openly. So you mentioned that in Taiwan, people actually believe that the Japanese actually has done wrong, but I think that there are some. I guess different views in Taiwan when it comes to the history of Japanese colonialism. Yes, so there's a gradual change in how Japan was、uh, is perceived in Taiwan. So it used to be the case that Japan launched a war of aggression against China, and they lost, and that's thanks to the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek and also the sacrifice of the Chinese people. No mention is made of the Communist Party and their contribution to the defeat of Japan. But over time, the emphasis on historical grievances against Japan was gradually dropped, and there seems to be more sort of focus on the good that Japan has brought to Taiwan. And、yeah. Japan has brought, you know, quite a good deal of progress to Taiwan, owing in no small part to the incompetence of the Qin Dynasty administration. For example, when I went back to Taiwan back in early 2023, I went to Hualien, which is a city on the east coast. I remember going to a a park near the beach, which was built in memory of a former Japanese governor of Hualien, who built up the city's infrastructure, including the port's facilities. So the younger generations in Taiwan do not really care about the historical grievances. There's a bit of nostal- nostalgia in the era of Japanese colonization. There are buildings and architecture from the colonial era that's have been borrowed to construct new buildings. They are now seen as somewhat fashionable. In fact, I want to go back to the period before the Japanese rule, which might shed some light on why the Japanese colonialism is actually viewed more favorably. Living standards during the Qin Dynasty in Taiwan was not high. The Qin were not good administrators. The imperial court was basically bankrupt. There was no infrastructure, no roads, or no real public service in Taiwan. So people remember the Qin Dynasty for its failure—failure failure to enforce law and to promote prosperity. When the Japanese took over after they won the Battle of the Yalu River in the First Sino-Japanese War, they started to build up Taiwan and also enforce regulations and law. And they did especially good job at reconciling disputes between the Han people and the Aboriginals who live in the mountains. This is in part done through brutally suppressing the Aboriginals. Just to be clear, my dad described the Taiwanese attitude to the Japanese colonial masters by using this phrase or the sentence: "It's like a stray dog finding a master, even though the masters sometimes beat them." So、people look up look up to Japan, and they forget about all the wrong things that the Japanese have done. So there, there's still some degree of grievances, but I would say the overall view of Japan is trending upwards as these historical grievances are gradually forgotten. That is such an interesting perspective to bring up because, in my reflection of how Taiwanese people are different from the mainlanders, historically, because they didn't. Exactly, experience that formative experience of trauma, that memory of being abused and just overall exploited. They didn't have that memory. They had the memory of being as the subject of the Japanese imperial empire. So、yep. they remember history differently, and therefore they didn't really resonate with that sense of grievances. Especially from what you just said, that. 
before their life was not good. The Qing didn't yeah. invest a lot of money in their quality of life. Now that the Japanese came over and took over Taiwan, people actually had a better quality of life. That was the kind of actual experience of the Taiwanese people, which is completely different from how we see it. We sort yeah. of see that, okay, it is ours and you took away our stuff. I don't really care. Whatever that you've done to Taiwan, like we just want our territory back, which is rightfully right. belong to us. So that is what how I have always been under, understanding the Taiwan issue. It is used to be ours and it has to be ours. <laughs> so uh, that was what I was taught uh, when I was younger. I mean, in line with what you just said, right? Why Senren, so people who follow Chiang Kai-shek's forces to Taiwan, they tend to have a slightly less favorable view of Japan compared to Ben Senren. And now I have a picture of, oh, in Taiwan, the Taiwanese identity actually means so many different things. It has the Taiwanese identity of the Wai Shenren. Then you also have the Taiwanese identity as the Ben Shenren. And they all have different nuanced views on Japan, on unification, on politics overall. So it's a very multifaceted subject. It's not mm. like an overarching pro-independent identity, a, a Taiwanese identity. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I will say, though, you know, what I've talked about today might downplay to a little bit the, the pro-independence forces that do exist in Taiwan. You know, you have to ask like a pro-independence person to get their, their view on, um, you know, whether Taiwan is a separate country to really fully understand that perspective. Which is exactly why I'm interrupting my own episode and let you guys know I am looking to have a conversation with someone who believes Taiwan is and should be independent. If you or if you know anyone who is interested in exploring this perspective with me, please hit me up on my Instagram or over email. Information in the description box. Now back to the episode. Right, so, so when Taiwan became a democratic, so KMT has to evolve and change, right? Previously, KMT was very much like, oh, we are Chinese, political Chinese, and we represent the political Chinese. Now, people, you have to actually compete for votes. Then I feel like this view is, it should mm. be, it has to be more mellowed. You just have to be more mellow with this sort of view. So after Li Donghui became the president, I think he actually uh, created this new Taiwanese identity. Like it doesn't matter if you are Wai Shen Ren, if you are, or if you are Ben Shen Ren Taiwanese. If you were born here, if you've lived here, you, if you believe yourself to be Taiwanese, then you are Ta Taiwanese. I feel like after him, Taiwanese identity has changed massively. I think that's that's right, or at least Li Denghui's election means that pro-independence or sort of nativist voices are now more allowed, whereas during the period of martial yeah. law, that's not allowed. There's yeah. this sort of built-up anger and resentment among the nativist or pro-independence activists that has been building over time. And once Taiwan became fully democratized, these voices, they became loud because they, they are backed with anger. So during the period of martial law, right, the narrative is to unify the mainland because we are Chinese and the government is the legit legitimate ruler of all of China. So pro-independence voices, they go against this dominance narrative. And the KMT, they, they were not very good with tolerating dissent. They cracked down on dissent brutally, just as bad, you know, if not worse than, than the Communist Party during certain periods. The KMT would just arrest thousands of people for voicing either leftist or pro-communist views or who, who voice pro-independence views. Originally, the pro-independence movement, when it got started in the 1970s or 80s or so, it wasn't actually bellicose, so they weren't warmongering by any means. They were calling on the governments to abandon the unification of the mainland by military means because they know that it's impossible. Are you crazy? Um, so they were actually pro-peace in a certain way. With the end of the martial law, this sort of anger and resentment that has been sort of building up because you, you've been suppressed for so long, spilled out into the open. That being said, though, when Li Denghui was elected, this view was not the mainstream. So when he was elected, um, Li Denghui presented this theory of two countries, Liang Guo Lun, which presented the mainland in Taiwan as two different countries. People in Taiwan did not support that. They thought he was insane. They by and large thought he was insane because it would invite war and it's also against everything that they've been taught up to that point. People were not pro-independence after he got in. It took a very long time for 
this Taiwanese identity, political identity to build up. Certain events contributed to this identity becoming ingrained. Part of it has to do with the rising tension with the mainland, the increase in cross straits tension in the aftermath of the 1996 um, missile crisis, when the mainland shot missiles at us, um, reinforcing supports for pro-independence candidates who are seen to be stronger. You know, we need stronger, we need stronger leaders to help us resist the evil communists who are firing missiles at us. Yeah. So the mainland's actions contributed in some way to the rise of the Taiwanese political identity. Another major event is the election of Chen Shui-bian in the year 2000. His election did gradually allow, at least in some ways, a gradual change in the schooling curriculum and the promotion of nativist Taiwanese independence ideology. You can see that, for example, in, in the emphasis on native language classes Aboriginal language, um, yeah. Taiyu, the Taiwanese yeah. language, I the heard Minan that. language, yeah. after Chen shui got in. It was a gradual change because he couldn't do it all of a sudden because he'll, he'll get too much pushback. But it did happen. So these two, two, two events, you know, combined with this long built-up anger among nativist activists, contributed to this Taiwanese political identity. And over time, this identity went from being pro-peace to, I guess, pro-war, or at least accepting of, of war as a way to gain independence. I read something on a book by an American scholar, and he wrote a very extensive study on how Taiwanese identity has changed over time. And there's a fun fact that I learned, which is that, so during the Ben Shenren time, so that was before the Japanese took, like, took mm -hmm. away Taiwan, there was no such thing as Taiwanese identity. There was no this overarching identity like Taiwanese identity. People live on, live, lived on an island only identify themselves yeah. as home village in terms of where the village, the home base that they, okay. that, that they want. So let's say you live in this village and you are originally from, let's say, you know, Mingnan or Fujian mm -hmm. or Shantou. They were like, oh, I am in this village and I originally came from, you know, Shantou. Mm -hmm. That was how they actually self-identified as before Japan colonized Taiwan. And when Japan actually colonized Taiwan, that was after 1895, something, that yeah, period. Yeah. And they, they had started to enforce Japanese language, teaching and literature. That education wasn't mandatory. So you can still keep your whatever uh, Fuzhou, Quanzhou, Shantou identity in Taiwan, but then you also learn a little Japanese. After 1945, uh, when Japan lost the Second World War and the KMT came over to Taiwan, the KMT government actually implemented a mandatory this forced mandarin education in schools have you heard that's of right. that yes, that's right yes so that's the Taiwanese identity is very complicated in the sense that it depends on when you will talk about it and mm. it depends on which what you are referring to so when after kmt government came to taiwan and and started to implement mandarin education actually i heard that they actually punish people who speak taiyu right oh yeah yeah they, they, they did yeah now DP, it became democratic, now DPP took over, and now there is more voice allowed for more, let's say, nativist views and policies. Mm. And now it is again changing and swifting uh, and switching to a another new trajectory. I feel like in the next 30 years, what it means to be Taiwanese will be very, very different. I, I think that's right. Taiwanese identity is also like a very ambiguous concept. It felt very ambiguous to me, and it felt like it is constantly evolving, depending on. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Born, <laughs> if you if you are born before nineteen nineties, if you have received that sort of education that that put on the overall civilizational Chinese, or if you are born after two thousands, when the educational system actually had a more focus on the Taiwanese native culture, so that will depend on your experience in Taiwan. Yeah, that. that's Thanks. right. I, I haven't even thought about how quickly the Taiwanese identity can change, you know, depending on which party gets in, what they did to the curriculum, um, you know, how I... the media changes, until you brought it up. That made me think of this, actually, and made me think, is it actually, you know, rather artificial? And, and maybe it is, yeah. Knowing that how Taiwanese identity has evolved gave me the ability to, let's say, cognitively resonate, sympathize with them. And I guess that it will be a very inauthentic 
for me, if I actually argue that I support Taiwan independence, and I ultimately conclude that that would be an inauthentic conclusion to draw in the end. So I'm not Taiwanese, so I I can't I can't really say that I can identify with that view. I think identity in the end is subjective. It is artificial. It's always is artificial because it's based on how humans feel, right? If you can convince enough、yeah. humans in a given area, geographic area, that they are distinct nation or distinct group, then you you've established an identity, and you can say you know that's illegitimate or artificial, but it is what it is. It's always been that way. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I think. I think that's the the thing that really gave me clarity was exactly this history and identity and all of these things are interpretations, and it is through interpretation that we learn. What our worldviews and what our viewpoints and values are, we we sort of compare the moral position of China and the U.S. For mainlanders, we say our military soldiers, we will we will absolutely sacrifice our life to fight for our motherland territory to win Taiwan over. We will be willingly lose our lives for this war, even though Taiwan would might potentially have the military support from the U.S. Whereas U.S. they don't have a moral strength. And the reason to actually fight for Taiwan to the death. What who would reasonably do that?、Uh, fighting for another place that you aren't evenly emotionally attached to. That's the sort of argument from the mainland. People who are not directly involved in the China or Taiwan, their opinion on this issue is not their opinion. It is basically whatever the、right. media or the government want them to know. So they they don't have an opinion essentially. So whenever like a、uh, American like red neck. Ish profile、uh, <laughs> users commenting under my video, like saying like whatever that they wanted to say on town, like oh you know go back to your China whatever. But I thought like like you know what the hell you're talking about? Like shut up. <laughs> my worst part of me wanted to think that the American mindset is this, right? Not every every American obviously, but many of them, they will look at a foreign country or foreign land and they conclude, and the media tells them, hey these are our friends, all right? We better supply them with weapons and. Um, security guarantees, and will come and promise to defend them if they come under attack. And when push comes to shove, right, they'll send them a lot of support in the beginning, like what you see with Ukraine. They'll, they'll send them weapons and money and diplomatic supports in the United Nations. And Americans, they might stick a sticker on their car, on the back of their car, saying "I support Ukraine" or "I support Taiwan." They'll feel good about it. But then a couple of years later. They'll discover, hey, it's actually getting too expensive. All right,、yeah. you know,、um, we have so so many homeless people on our streets. The prices of everyday items are going up. Why are we sending money overseas to support these people that we don't really know much about when life at home is actually getting worse? Yeah, and and then they start to talk about their friends a lot less, and they start to talk about why they maybe should. Shouldn't support them anymore. We should start cutting back on the funding so that we can have more for ourselves because that's what matters. Interactions between countries and countries. It is all about where your interests lie. I don't necessarily think that the U.S. really cares about Taiwan and being friends with Taiwan. Before Taiwan turned democratic, Taiwan like KMT was a one-party dictatorship. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. like you still supported Taiwan because you want to be against China. So it's kind of like the logic of. Whoever is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I, I think we haven't seen the final chapter. You know, do do I think you know unification can happen peacefully? I I honestly don't think so. How do you hope that the whole situation resolves itself? I was okay. So my opinion would be for now. I am kind of with. The best solution is no solution for now. But、okay. I, like in my mind, I think that there will be one point. There will be something happened that makes us a little trajectory prompt that, let's say, incentivize Beijing to do something or incentivize Taiwan to do something, and then one after the other, something else happened, and we reach a resolution. Yeah, like reach a resolution militarily, or like because of some. I think it would be militarily. Okay. Yeah. Because just because, external... yeah, just because of some external events that triggered that happening, I can't see how the Beijing's agenda could be supported by the Chinese people, and that's like my honest opinion. I, I can't see how both can align politically. So there has to be some kind of external force that、yeah. prompts something to change, right? Yeah, 
Um, I agree. Yeah, I, I just hope if something does happen, and I, I think it's more likely than not in my lifetime, it's, it can just happen very quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd be very disappointed. I'd be very saddened if, um, you know, you have a two year war like you have in Ukraine and just, oh, God. Um, I, I think that's, that's just a terrible outcome. And it just shows. Yeah. Yeah. It shows what happens when you um, believe in idealism and false promises over, well, common sense. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> feel a bit embarrassed. Yeah. no, no. This is a very sensitive topic, and I think that it's also very close to heart for many people. So Yeah. I'm really glad that you you shared, uh, as well as your wife and your your father as well. Thank So you. I'm really Yeah. glad that we, we got that from you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you for um, taking me to your show. And um, this has been a, um, the last couple of minutes have been, has been a bit cathartic, um, if you heard that word before. Um, yeah, because of an outpouring of emotions, which I wasn't planning for. Um, yeah, I.